All right, so this is the overview video for chapter 13, gravitation. This is a finally the chapter that covers Newton's law of universal gravitation. Different textbooks do this differently. An old textbook that we used to use by Gian Colley um, used to cover Newton's law of universal gravitation much earlier. Uh, there's something to be said for either approach. Um, the one benefit of covering gravity so late is basically we can cover everything. Things like energy, um, like everything just uh, in this one uh, chapter. Whereas if you had introduced the Newton's law of universal gravitation earlier, then um, you'd kind of have to um, wait for the derivation of a gravitational potential energy until you cover energy. And then wait for um, talking about orbits until you cover angular momentum and so on. So, um, so I, you know, I, I think I do like OpenStax approach because up until now, we didn't really need the Newton's law of universal gravitation. MG was fine. But now we are finally covering the full law. And the one thing I will say, the order in which I lecture and the order in which your textbook covers is slightly different. So your textbook does cover history of uh, gravitation. So, you know, they do cover it. Um, and for me, I like to cover history of gravitation alongside a bit of a history about uh, astronomy, basically what is um, here, you know, in Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which I want to consider to be the beginning of modern astronomy. So uh, in the recorded lectures, you will see, you will basically see me start out with the Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And historically, that's accurate too, because uh, when Newton was thinking about, um, Newton and other people were thinking about the kind of distance relationship that uh, universal gravitation might follow. Um, the main way to test that was by comparing against the Kepler's law of planetary motion. So, um, so Newton's law of universal gravitation, it's quite simple. It's this one formula <laughs> that the gravitational force between two objects is inversely proportional, that's this uh, denominator, to the square of the distance between the two, r squared. And uh, to make that proportionality into equality, you need this constant of proportionality, that's a g, that's a universal constant. There's an experiment down there that measures it. And it's also proportional to the product of the masses of the two things. And this unit vector here, it serves to give you the direction of the force. It's between the two, uh, two objects uh, in an attractive direction. So I believe your textbook has yeah illustration of the direction of the forces. Um, yeah, so that's the statement of Newton's law of universal gravitation. And that's it. Uh, compared to other laws you will see in physics of 4b, for example, um, Newton's law of universal gravitation is just one equation. When you cover uh, electromagnetism in physics 4b, you will see four distinct interlinked equations. That's the Maxwell's equations. Um, so when depending on who you ask, um, sometimes people will say this is the first uh, theory of physics. Um, yeah, I guess kind of first the theory that involves only one equation. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So, okay. The next uh, uh, subsection describes the Cavendish experiment. And I don't think we talk about it too much, but this is um, in terms of like a history of development of mechanics. This is, um, um, this is a wonderful experiment, just a level of precision that would be needed to measure things like this and the significance of the, the experiment measuring this G. Uh, sometimes people refer to this as weighing or measuring the mass of Earth. Because once you know the constant is g, and we already know the, the orbital period of the moon, then uh, you can use that fact to uh, calculate the mass of Earth based on the orbit of moon around the Earth, which um, you can relate to mass through, um, well, through the, the a couple other things that your textbook will go over soon. So this is the Cavendish experiment. Uh, read it through it, please. Now, um, uh, I don't think there are that many lecture questions on it. I think there um, might be one homework question asks about, you know, here are two objects. What's the force between them? It's a really tiny force. Um, yeah, so I think that's the statement of Newton's law of universal gravitation. And um, your textbook goes through some sections calculating the amount of gravitational force uh, near Earth's surface. So this is the 
connection with how we used to, do, to treat gravity, mg, uh, that force is equal to this uh, full law. Uh, so it's a matter of, well, what is R? Uh, in case of, uh, if, if you're dealing with uh, objects near the surface of the Earth, then this R is taken to be the radius of the Earth. And you can also use this more or less to low Earth orbit object, because uh, the, diame the radius of Earth being more than 6,000 kilometers. The low Earth orbit is something like 100, 200, 300 kilometers. That distance is small compared to this. So, um, so the, I guess the fun fact is that the amount of gravitational force on the astronauts in orbit, like at International Space Station, that's basically the same as the amount of gravitational force on you on Earth, um, yeah, maybe like 5% less. Uh, the difference is that for you to maintain your relative position, you have normal force. That's the uh, that's the apparent weight that you feel. Uh, for astronaut orbiting the Earth, there's no normal force, so they feel weightless. Uh, but they're not actually weightless in the sense of not having any gravitational force on them. So, so this connects uh, the lower lower case g that we've been working with with the upper case g and other fundamental constant. And um, this section has a discussion of gravitational field, which you won't hear me talk about all that much. Um, I do talk about field in physics 4B uh, with the electric field and magnetic field. And especially if you will be taking physics 4B, I think it might be worth uh, reading through this section and kind of uh, see if uh, um, the field idea they talk about here makes sense. Um, because you will see that idea when we get to electricity and magnetism next semester. So, uh, so you can talk about the gravitational acceleration G as the gravitational field caused by this mass. And when you place the test masses around the space, then it feels the gravitational force caused by the field produced by this mass. Um, it's a kind of a mathematical tool that we do a fuller job of introducing once we are in um, Physics 4B. And um, I, I don't quite like the use of the apparent weight in this particular subsection of the textbook, but do read it through. It's just talking about uh, what kind of force is needed to maintain your position. And when you are on the equator, then because you are actually going in circular motion, uh, that does change what normal force is needed. So I guess in that sense, maybe it's still apparent weight. Uh, I do like to reserve the word apparent weight to just mean normal force and no other forces. <laughs> that kind of simplifies problem solving. So, um, yeah, results. Are, so all these, uh, I think gravity away from surface. I think uh, surface. I think these are all uh, good examples to think through, read it through. I don't think you will see a lot of homework questions on that. And gravitational potential energy and total energy. I think I did a derivation of that in an earlier worksheet question where there was a question about escape velocity. So all this exercise we could have done earlier when we covered energy. So uh, what they are driving here, you know, using the fact that change in potential energy is equal to minus times the work done by conservative force, which gravity is. Um, that gives you the change of potential energy going from one radius to another radius. And um, and I think uh, uh, they are using the convention that R1 is really far away from, um, or, so they are, set, they are setting U1 equal to zero, which means R1 is uh, like infinity. So one over R1 is equal to zero. And let's see, do they justify setting one over R to basically infinity? So I don't think they do it explicitly. So in the lecture, you will see that covered as what I call universal reference point. Uh, that's, uh, um, that's basically the point of infinity. It's like, you know, imagine when you are on Earth, um, like, any, like my surface is on my desk. That's a super local reference point. No one else knows how high the surface of my desk is. But um, I think everyone's used to looking at the sun, looking at the moon, looking at the stars. And stars are kind of like something that anybody can look at and you will all see the same stars. So those distant stars are universal reference point. 
and um, adapting that to kind of the general setting, uh, point at infinity away is a universal reference point. So, so we use that in our most conventions about potential energy, like the gravitational potential energy, which goes as one over R. We set uh, at R infinity to be zero. That allows you to get simple expression like this. So, so this is the expression for the gravitational potential energy uh, for the universal uh, gravitational uh, force, uh, where basically with the R changing significantly, the, there's a possibility of gravitational force changing. So you need a version that's dri derived through this integral. So uh, I think they yeah, apply that to talk about all this. And uh, if you apply this to really super short distances, like uh, one kilometer, you'll find that that result does um, kind of reduce it down to something that's close to what we've been using, MGH. So, um, yeah, conservation of energy with all this. And I think I did escape velocity derivation like a month ago uh, in connection with the worksheet that we used when we were in energy and momentum. Uh, so you, you can look at that if you want the derivation. Um, I do think this is kind of a derivation. Uh, and I've calculated this for Earth, like 11 kilometers per second or so. And, and so it might be a little bit less. I forget the exact number. Um, energy and gravitationally bound object. Yeah. And uh, when it's, uh, we see that, yeah. Um, so, uh, and if the total energy is negative, then the kinetic energy must zero. So binary value and u is negative. So, total so yeah, so that negative total energy uh, corresponds to gravitationally being bound, or you know any kind of bound thing. With that zero being universal infinite reference, negative potential energy will always mean, or negative total energy will always mean something that's bound. That they cannot get infinitely far away from each other. So with that, a uh, satellite orbit and energy, it, I, from my perspective, that's kind of another application of the expressions that's been derived there. Um, and, um, and the, you know, the centripetal acceleration, I think I mentioned it becomes important later on. Um, this is one of those places. And, um, you know, the one thing about orbit is just how um, tightly determined it is. So a lot of times, I think it doesn't occur to people that if you know the radius of an object uh, in an orbit, and you know that it's a circular orbit, that information alone already determines what velocity would have. That's how they can go through this derivation. They have the, the velocity for a circular orbit just totally determined by constant and the radius at which it is. Sometimes, you know, textbook question writers forget that and they invent the two numbers, you know, radius and, um, and the velocity, and you can't do that. Once you determine the radius, then you've already determined the velocity, kind of. Or if you determine the velocity on its own, then you've determined um, radius, kind of, by determining the velocity. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, now, if you don't have a circular motion, then you could have an elliptical motion, um, too. I think some of our satellites that we use for uh, observation are in elliptical orbit. So, International Space Station, I think it's close to, you know, circular orbit. Uh, yeah, and uh, actually, so looking at this expression for, you know, objects in circular orbit, there's a curious coincidence, like, uh, you know, kinetic energy and uh, potential energy, they look so similar, like it's just a factor of uh, one over two difference. Uh, resulting in a total energy that's, you know, just like a, a factor of one over two difference from the potential energy. And what I will tell you is there's a, something called the Virial Theorem uh, that is actually responsible for these nice looking dependencies like that. Let me just spell out what Virial, how Virial Theorem spells. And, you know, if you're interested, you can look it up on your own. It's not something that we actually cover, um, but something called the Virial Theorem which is more of an appropriate topic for upper division mechanics, sometimes called the analytical mechanics. Uh, something called the Virial theorem is basically responsible for these factors here. Uh, once you know the kind of the form of the force or the form of the potential energy, 
then you, you uh, have you can fully determine what kind of um, analytical form the total energy and the um, the kinetic energy should they have. And the the thing that proves that is something called the Virial theorem. Um, I, I'm kind of uh, oversimplifying it. If you're interested, go take a look at it. It is fun topic. So with that, I think that's it for satellite orbit um, and the Kepler's laws. As I was saying, uh, when I lecture, I cover this first because uh, Kepler's laws are completely experimental laws. Kepler was relying on the data gathered by Tycho Brahe, who he worked as an uh, uh, apprentice, I think, last two to three years of observation. And um, he came up with these laws by guess and check. You know, with first law is actually pretty important because it, this is really groundbreaking in no longer assuming that the 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 orbital or planetary orbits are circular. And uh, I remember reading stories about how Kepler went through some geometric theorem that would show what kind of things in Tycho Brahe's data must be true if orbits really were actually circular. And when he analyzed the data for Mars, he saw that uh, the orbital observation of orbital motion of Mars doesn't fit those, um, uh, doesn't obey those uh, theorems that he derived. So, so he guessed the, um, the elliptical shape, and uh, I think he found that then the observations all fit. And once you have an elliptical orbit, then you can talk about Kepler's second law, which relates how fast one object is moving at one part of the orbit, the part that's closer to the focus with the actual sun massive object in it, it moves faster there, and then it moves slower out here when it's far at near the other focus, which we call aphelion or. Um, if uh, it's about satellites around the Earth, then we talk about apogee. So Kepler's second law. And the Kepler's third law is the kind of the odd one out. Uh, it, um, um, the, it, it, uh, it, it, Kepler's first and second law were about orbit of a single planet. For Kepler's third law, you are comparing, um, well, the way Kepler stated, it would be comparing two different objects. And you can see the justification for that from Newton's law of universal gravitation. Um, the, things that you derived earlier and um, the Kepler, what the Kepler's third law says, that the period squared is uh, proportional to semi-major axis uh, to the cubed. Um, so, so yeah, it's, uh, um, so I guess uh, introducing it here, they can basically derive Kepler's laws from Newton's law of universal gravitation, which might make a philosophical sense because Newton's law of universal gravitation is the more fundamental law. So any you do deriving other things from that fundamental law. Um, but in terms of historical accuracy, it's the Kepler's laws which gave experimental support to, to the Newton's law of universal gravitation. Because uh, Newton being the genius at uh, calculus he is, he was able to actually go through um, the consequences of his law of universal gravitation and uh, figure out that given this inverse square law, that the object would follow an elliptical orbit, uh, following uh, having these properties that actually comes from conservation of angular momentum. So, so I think that's the last of the sections in chapter 13 we cover in any detail. Um, tidal forces, because there aren't really uh, quantitative questions we can ask, there aren't really many uh, or any <laughs> or more question on that. And Einstein's theory of gravity, it's kind of the same deal. There aren't any quantitative questions we can ask. So, um, so we don't really cover it. I do encourage you to read through it, uh, maybe in anticipation of when you might be taking physics 4C. So uh, I do encourage you to read through it, but otherwise um, you won't see any homework questions from section 13.7. I mean, it's interesting to read the through, so I do recommend it. Yeah, I think this is a relative recent data. Uh, I discovered um, there's a simulation software that you've seen me use in one of the lectures that actually has this orbital data programmed into it. Looking at it in 3D kind of rotatable way was kind of fun. Um, but again, no more questions. So I think that's it for uh, chapter 13. Uh, again, it's between with the chapters 12 and 13. They are both kind of short chapters. So we cover them both in this one week.